Good evening. evening. Welcome to Calvary for our final midweek Lenten Wednesday Vesper service. Today, we are going to focus on Psalm 118, which is a wonderful psalm of praise, uh, wonderful declarations of all that God has done to save us, his children. May God bless our time together in his word. We'll sing our first hymn, hymn 367, Christ Be My Leader. of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord, open my lips. Hasten to save me, O God. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord God, you have brought us safely to this hour of evening prayer. We thank you for providing all that we need for body and life. Bless us who have gathered in your name. Forgive our sins, speak to our hearts, dispel our sorrows with the comfort of your word, and receive our hymns of thanks and praise through Jesus Christ, our living Savior, who reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us pray. Let our prayers be acceptable in your sight. Come and help us in time of need, that we may sing your praise in holy joy, now and forever, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 
We join to sing Psalm 118. We'll sing Psalm 118 in unison. Lord Jesus, when you rose victorious from death, you gave us a day of great rejoicing. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone of our faith. Let cries of joy and exultation ring out to celebrate the good news of your resurrection. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our scripture reading is from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15. Brothers, I am going to call your attention to the gospel that I preached to you. You received it, and you took your stand on it. You are also being saved by that gospel that was expressed in the words I preached to you, if you keep your hold on it, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to over 500 brothers at the same time, 
most of whom are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. Last of all, he appeared also to me, the stillborn child, so to speak. For I am the least of the apostles, and I am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted God's church. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not ineffective. On the contrary, I worked more than all of them. Yet it wasn't my doing, but it was the grace of God which was with me that did it. So, whether it is I or they, that is what we preach, and that is what you believed. Now, if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how is it that some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is pointless, and your faith is pointless too. Then we are even guilty of giving false testimony about God, because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it were true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Then it also follows that those who fell asleep in Christ perished. If our hope in Christ applies only to this life, we are the most pitiful people of all. But in fact, Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came by a man, the resurrection of the dead also is going to come by a man. For as in Adam they all die, so also in Christ they all will be made alive. The word of the Lord. We sing our hymn of the day, hymn 339, Today Your Mercy Calls Us.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. This evening we'll consider Psalm 118, verses 19 through 24. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is God's word. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Psalm 118 is all about deliverance and salvation. And unfortunately, we just don't have the time this evening to give full consideration to all of Psalm 118. So I'm going to encourage you in the next day or so to set aside a little bit of time and read through Psalm 118 in its entirety. And as you do that, I think that you will see what I'm talking about. Psalm 118 is all about salvation. Now, our narrator here, the speaker, the one writing this psalm, he describes this terrible situation from which the Lord God had delivered him. He felt as though all of his enemies were buzzing around his head, swarming around him like bees that were ready to make their attack on him. He says all of these hostile foes have surrounded him, walled him in on four sides, and they keep pressing and pressing in on him. He feels as if he's only inches away from falling into death. And yet, the Lord saved him. This deliverance and salvation of which our psalmist speaks, this deliverance and salvation that comes from the Lord God is such a key and central theme in Psalm 118. And it's all about deliverance and salvation. And that is why God's people have been singing Psalm 118 on days where they recall the Lord's great delivering and saving acts. For instance... Jews have sung Psalm 118 on Passover, the day in which they remember their deliverance from the destroying angel and the plagues in Egypt, the day when they remember the parting of the Red Seas and how they were saved from their Egyptian foes. And likewise, Christians too sing Psalm 118 on Easter, the day where we celebrate an empty tomb and our own victory through Christ over sin, death, and Satan. Psalm 118 is all about salvation. As we look back on our Lenten worship series, particularly these meditations on the Psalms that we've had, we see how great that salvation is, don't we? I mean, just consider all the ways that these Psalms have made known to us our depravity, and just how many and varied our sinful behaviors and actions can be. Way back five weeks ago in Psalm 45, it was pointed out to us that so often we love wickedness and hate righteousness. Psalm 2 highlighted all of the ways that we have been defiant towards God, the ways that we have taken our stand against his will and his Ten Commandments. In Psalm 22, we see Messiah Jesus being forsaken by God because of our sin. We see him taking on the punishment that our sin deserves. And then last week in Psalm 16, we saw that our confidence in God is not always at 100%. Certainly, the Psalms do show us our own sinfulness. But our Psalms also show us that God's salvation and forgiveness is greater than our sinfulness. Of course, we've seen that in the Psalms the last few weeks. Whether they present Jesus, the perfect and holy king who obeyed God's law perfectly on our behalf, whether they present the suffering servant who goes to die on a cross to spill his blood so that payment for sin might be made, whether they present a Jesus now alive walking out of his tomb, we see, we see in these Psalms, the story of Jesus. And that story of Jesus is 
the story of our deliverance and salvation. And so then, we may join in with the words of Psalm 118. We may join our hearts and our voices in declaring right alongside of him, yes, the Lord has become my salvation. We may sing those joyous words before us. We may tell them to those seated near us. We may ring out the praises just as we see them ringing out there. The Lord answered me. The Lord has become my salvation. The Lord has done it. He's talking about saving us. And that salvation is marvelous in our eyes. Those words that we see there in Psalm 118, they are spoken by people who are so joyous and happy. They are spoken by people who can't even begin to fathom how great God's salvation is. And that salvation, just, just as we heard there, it truly is just that amazing. And so then... That proclamation that we heard in verse 24, it really is the appropriate response to this salvation, isn't it? This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So simple and yet so profound. It is indeed true that this day the Lord comes to us with his forgiveness. He stands right before us as we sit in these chairs and he puts that word of forgiveness into our ears. He touches our hearts with that word of forgiveness. This is the day that the Lord has made. Now, wouldn't it be great if everybody responded to God's deliverance and salvation in the same way that we see it here in Psalm 118? Wouldn't that just be wonderful? It is sad, though, that we even have to ask that question in the first place. But the reality in our world is that most people don't respond to the Lord's salvation with joy and thanksgiving. Matter of fact, most people will respond to the Lord's salvation with rejection. They hate that message. I mean, just consider the Pharisees. I know we've talked about them a lot in this Lenten season, but they're a prime example, aren't they? The Lord's salvation, Jesus Christ himself, literally stood right before those men, showing them the error of their ways, teaching them the truth, showing them how they might be saved. But they still plotted against Jesus. They still tried to figure out all of these ways that they might stop him and put him to death. Pontius Pilate, he's another good example. He confessed that Jesus was not guilty of wrongdoing, but he didn't stop the Pharisees. He didn't stop the Sanhedrin. Salvation stood right before him. Jesus said, yes, I am the king. I am the king of God's heavenly kingdom. But from both of those camps, the Pharisees, Pilate, there wasn't a whole lot of rejoicing going on there. There wasn't a whole lot of praises being sent up to God for God's salvation. Just consider our own day. Take the Muslim man who thinks that Jesus is is only a prophet and nothing else. Take the atheist or the agnostic that isn't impressed by the story of Jesus, who, who isn't convinced of the truth of that story. It's all the same, right? Only the names have changed. And what our psalmist says there is true. What was true back in those days is just as true today. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The message of Jesus and salvation in his name just doesn't elicit a positive, happy, joyous response from most. It's just the opposite. The message of Jesus all too often elicits rejection and hatred and anger. Well, it's a good thing that us Christians make up for all of this lack of enthusiasm, right? Well, maybe, maybe not always. Maybe that isn't always the case. Sure, we all made the time to be here this evening. We go to church on Sunday 
as we are able. That's good. I guess we're not like those builders. We haven't completely and outright rejected Jesus. But I, I tell you, in a number of ways, we're really not all that different from those builders who reject the stone. I mean, sure, I, I may be here physically, but am I really here present in my mind and in my heart? I mean, I will be the first one in this room to admit that I have sat in many a church pew, lifeless, expressionless, and dead. I will be the first one to admit that I have sat in many a church pew refusing to sing the hymns for whatever reason that might be. I have not kneeled before my Lord's altar in humility and reverence to receive his own body and blood from his hands. And sometimes I'm here, but I'm not really here. Our psalmist says, open for me the gates of righteousness and I will enter in. But, but if we're being completely honest here, sometimes, sometimes for us that looks more like this. I will enter through that open door, but that's about it. How often will we enter God's courts without praise and thanksgiving? How often will we enter God's courts by rote simply because that's just what you do on a Sunday morning? How often our hearts don't bring their all? So often when I'm here, I'm not worshiping. I'm not marveling at God or standing in awe of the things that he has done. So often, I'm just taking up space. Maybe our rejection isn't, or, or our attitude isn't outright rejection like those builders. But there are striking similarities between us and those builders. Brothers and sisters, let's change that. Because we have every reason to enter these courts with thanksgiving and praise. We have every reason to stand before God and shout out his name, to ring out his praises and to offer our thanksgiving to him. We hear quite a bit in those final five verses there about this gate of righteousness, this gate through which the righteous may enter. And I tell you what, that gate has been open to us. That gate previously had been locked up, sealed up tight with chains and padlocks because of our sinfulness. But that gate that once was closed has been swung wide open. And how is that? Jesus gives us the answer. Open for me the gates of righteousness. This is the gate through which we may enter. Is any of that language ringing a bell? Very similar language, very similar talk about a gate is used elsewhere in Scripture in, in, in another well-known and beloved section of the Bible. In John chapter 10, the Lord Jesus himself says, I am the gate for the sheep. Jesus is the gate that leads heavenward. Jesus is the gate that leads to blessed life with him and a wonderful inheritance in heaven. And how has he become that gate? How has he opened that gate for us again? Jesus would give us the answer. In that same well-known and famous and beloved section of Scripture, Jesus would remind us that I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd does lay down his life for his sheep. The good shepherd goes to battle for his helpless sheep. The good shepherd goes to accomplish the things that his helpless sheep could not accomplish on their own. The good shepherd lives that life that God demanded in perfect obedience to his father's will and his father's commandments, a life that he lived on behalf of us sheep who could not live that life. The good shepherd walks the way of the cross, gives up his own life, sheds his own blood so that payment for sin could be made a payment that you and I were not going to make on our own. The good shepherd goes to fight for his sheep. And that's how he opens that gate. That is how he opens that door that leads to heaven. So can't you see 
Can't you see why our psalmist also refers to Jesus as the capstone? He's that big stone right at the top holding those two arches together. He's that stone that supports our life. He's that stone that supports our faith. He's the stone that holds us up, the stone that gives us strength and enables us to endure. He's the only stone and he's the only gate that does that for us. Of course, there are many out there, many who claim to be the gate, many who claim to be the stone. But if their message does not present to you a good shepherd who died and came back to life for you, they are not true stones, they are not true gates, and they only lead to destruction. Jesus is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. And he's the only gate through which we may enter into eternal life. And just as we heard in Psalm 118, the Lord has done this. God the Father did appoint Jesus to suffer and die for sins. God the Father did raise Jesus back to life as proof that our sins truly are forgiven in Christ. And in doing that, God the Father made Jesus to be that gate. In doing that, God the Father swung that gate open. In doing that, God the Father delivers forgiveness, life, and salvation to all of us. The Lord has done it. This is the day that the Lord has made. And you know what? That really is quite a wonderful statement. That really is quite marvelous in our eyes. And I've seen it. I have seen the smiles that this message brings to your face. I've seen the way that you proclaim this word to your brothers and sisters at Calvary as you sit in those pews and sing the praises of God. I've seen tears flow from your face, tears of joy, tears that are so struck with awe by what God has done to save you. I've heard your stories about how you take that message to the people that you know. I know that this message is wonderful in your eyes. I know this message fills you up and brings you joy and happiness. Brothers and sisters, keep that up. Stick with the joy, stick with the happiness, and be oh so eager to hear again and again the story of Jesus because that story of Jesus is the story of your salvation. And for one last time, the Lord has done it. This is the day that he has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. God grant it. Amen. We join to sing the Magnificat.
readings this evening from Luther's small catechism are the ninth and tenth commandments as well as the conclusion. The ninth commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. What does this mean? We should fear and love God that we do not scheme to get our neighbor's inheritance or house or obtain it by a show of right, but do all we can to help him keep it. The tenth commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife workers, animals, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. What does this mean? We should fear and love God that we do not force or entice away our neighbor's spouse, workers, or animals, but urge them to stay and do their duty. And the conclusion. What does God say about all these commandments? He says, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. What does this mean? God threatens to punish all who transgress these commandments. Therefore, we should fear his anger and not disobey what he commands. But he promises grace and every blessing to all who keep these commandments. Therefore, we should love and trust in him and gladly obey what he commands. In the closing hours of this day, hear us as we pray, O Lord. Lord have for the well being of people everywhere, for the growth of your church in all the world, and for the strengthening of all who serve and worship here, we pray, O Lord. Lord have for one another, young and old, for your blessings that come with every stage of life, and for joy in doing your will, we pray, O Lord. For our public servants who work day and night to bring protection, justice, learning, and health to this and every place, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord hear our for favorable weather and bountiful harvests, for clothing and food, for health of body, mind, and spirit, and for deliverance from all sin and every form of evil, we pray to you, O Lord. For the faithful who have gone before us, who have shared with us your good news, whose souls are now at rest in your heavenly kingdom, we give you thanks, O Lord. In thanksgiving for your many and varied gifts to us, we now commend ourselves to your care. Be our shield and strength, O Lord. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray, forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me so that the wicked foe may have no power over me. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Almighty and merciful God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless and keep you.
We'll sing our closing hymn, hymn 589, Now the Day is Over. Once again, good evening to you all. Thank you for joining us for our midweek Lenten Vespers services. This is the last Wednesday Vesper service we will have um, for the year. But remember, next week is Holy Week. We will have divine service on Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Easter Vigil on Saturday, and of course, Easter Sunday. So got a busy week. Uh, I always get to spend time at church. I thought I would share a little bit of my joy with you in Holy Week and invite you to come out four days in a row. God be with you all till we meet again.